now treasuries are like directly get like this whole thing about fed independence or central bank it's all out the window because um they're just working directly like treasury has a huge account it gets the money in reserve form from the fed it's an, now the the treasury has an asset they also issue their bonds directly to the fed as a liability for them but then how does that money leak out in the economy it leaks out in the form of those stimulus checks and um they're going there's no reserve ratio on them so they're going so i do i mean they they have to be hyper but not hyperinflation but they by definition they have to be inflationary because there's there's just nothing backing them on the other side except for some demand for uh government bonds but they're not even out of the market i mean the fed is buying it directly from the treasury it, it seems that the growth of such an asset requires an exponential sort of boom because uh because of a variety of factors and that's just that seems what it does do i think that it will blow past like gold in one run i probably you know absolutely not but i do think you know if you see it blow past 20,000 and then go to like 100,000 maybe 200,000 certainly could do that it's still going to be below uh the top four currencies is that at that number i don't i don't i don't i don't know who, who knows i mean maybe maybe it blows up to 250 300 in the next yeah. run and then i put that actually in the um in the notes is that i think as that uh -huh. is that multiplier uh, the notes of my table as that multiplier goes towards one uh of basically the uh you know the value of bitcoin instead of being like 99x smaller than uh then fiat but if it goes to basically one yeah i don't see why we wouldn't at least start to have other people understand things in the unit of a, of satoshi or the unit of a of a btc for sure i think that's a great point and i think that has to happen in the next 10 years but these are glacial things these definitely are, are slow um I, th I think that has to happen hey how are you all doing my name is kevin davani i'm the host of the total bitcoin podcast show and the Total Connector Show, together with my co-moderator, Stephanie von Jahn, economist, Austrian economist, Bitcoiner, amazing author. Uh, we're going to talk to Matthew Masinski of Crypto Voices. He's an extraordinary, fascinating analyst, and which breaks down things in very crystal clear language. We're going to talk about money, 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 and of course, Bitcoin. We're talking, of course, you know, certainly we're going to talk about gold, silver, governmental fiat money, and all that, you know, compared with Bitcoin's 21 million, absolute scarcity versus relative scarcity of gold. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, Bitcoin as a unit of account, uh, the, the FOMO that's been kicking in on, on a lot of levels, institutional, individual, corporate, governmental, uh, or even central banking level. So it's going to be a really exciting fact. I'm really looking forward to that. So without further ado, this is our talk with Matthew Mashinsky together with Stephanie von Jan. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Let me know what you think afterwards. Let, let me know your questions. And please, if you loved it as much as I did, please give it a like, share, subscribe, please, to my YouTube channel and to my podcast platforms. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon again. All right, welcome to the show. My two special guests is Matthew Masinski from Crypto Voices and Stefanie von Jan. Uh, she's an economist and lectures on Austrian economy, economics, uh, writes excellent articles. Matthew, would you just for, the, for our listeners, because you, I mean, you've been on my show, but uh, maybe a short introduction, give a short introduction about yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, guten Tag to you both. Uh, nice to meet you, Stephan Stephanie. I haven't uh, met you before. Uh, yes, as uh, Kayvon mentioned, been on the show, uh, I guess, once or twice before. Um, I host uh, a podcast uh, primarily focused on economics and money and Bitcoin uh, called Crypto Voices. Um, and also I uh, put out uh, this quarterly release on the global monetary base, which is uh, at the moment it's growing, but at the moment it's a collection of the top 30 floating fiat currencies looking at their monetary base and see how fast it grows and comparing that with Bitcoin. So as far as mostly things to do with the Bitcoin world or crypto world or even sort of economic, public facing economics that I do, that's mostly it. Awesome. So 
um, Stephanie, um, uh, you have you have your own uh, like very very excellent questions already prepared, and I uh, you've you've written Matthew, you've written a really excellent uh, um, a Twitter thread on you know on this relationship of you know Bitcoin, gold, silver, base money, and there's just some points that I would like to emphasize or which stand out for me for the you know the Joe and Mary from the streets. Um, um, for example, there are some like facts that you've uh, written. Uh, about, for example, that the um, that uh, because it's always you know it's always mentioned that the central banks have been buying like hundreds of tons of gold in the last months and years, and uh, what I wasn't aware of really is that, uh, for example, that the central banks nowadays have actually much less substantially less gold reserves than in the year I think it was 1965, right? Um, Maybe you can elaborate. Uh, I have a couple of other questions, but maybe we can start off with gold just to, you know, have it a check mark. Uh, like how much gold is there really? And considering now that they have found, uh, I think it Polius, uh, the corporation Polius in Rus Rus uh, Russia have found the biggest gold reserves in Subuk Lok in Siberia. I think approximately 60 million ounces. So, you know, it's it's this interesting thing of relative scarcity and absolute scarcity. Uh, I want to know, like, what kind of implications does this have uh, if uh, just, you know, the initial findings in Siberia on, you know, on the, uh, on the, on the, you know, on the relative scarcity and the stock to flow ratio, maybe, uh, and the, you know, uh, sort of unknown or relative unknown scarcity or also, uh, a difficult auditability of gold. Um, thank you. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots to say on gold uh, and Bitcoin and silver as always. But um, my uh, sort of interest or what I like to try to do is really just try to kind of lay the landscape before really even making predictions or making sort of uh, uh, broad implications of what that, what that might mean. I do make a few of them. But um, yeah, there's a few interesting things regarding gold uh, on, a, on a relative basis and on an absolute basis, as you mentioned, first of all. So right now, uh, there's about one. I like to think in ounces because it's price per ounce. Uh, and, and usually the gold industry doesn't do that. For some reason, they, they, write, they uh, record in metric tons. But there's about 1.1 uh, billion ounces of gold in central banks, uh, if we believe them. And that's another thing, because, of course, the World Gold Council, GATA, there's a lot of people that um, have researched uh, the possibility that central banks have actually, they hold gold as sort of a superposition, like a Schrodinger's cat of two two simultaneously things uh, on their books, which cannot happen. One is that it's an asset, like it sits in a vault, and the other is it's a receivable, which they have lent out to the market, presumably to keep the price down over the long term. You know, Bill Murphy from GATA has done a lot of work on that. There's a lot of people that have done a lot of work on that. I don't know, uh, I cannot, cannot say for sure if that's true or not. You know, the United States gold supply has not changed much at all in the last 30, 40 years. It's never been audited as we know. So we <clears throat> we kind of just take it on faith or face value that 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 it is what they say that it is. But um, it's r r roughly one sixth of all the gold that's ever been mined is supposedly in central banks. So it's about 6 billion ounces and 1.1 billion ounces is in the coffers of central banks as an asset. Um, now, the interesting thing is that the, in the in the sixties and the seventies, when famously uh, Charles de, Charles de Gaulle was claiming his gold uh, from the U.S., which was the last sort of thing that you could do with a tie from real money, gold being you know to fiduciary media, which is basically the tickets that a bank or government can issue. The last sort of claim that you could ever do ended, as most gold bugs know and Bitcoin bugs know, in 1971. Uh, that was a primarily result of, you know, the U.S. spending the Vietnam War and Charles de Gaulle claiming that gold back from the U.S. And the U.S. eventually just said, no, OK, we're not going to we're not going to redeem anymore. You can't redeem uh, gold. So interestingly, that, um, you know, the, the world didn't collapse. Markets went on. They adjusted, adapted. Um, and the as you mentioned, that was actually the peak, uh, at least officially and presumably still. Uh, in, in gold holdings of central banks was in, in about the 60s, mid 60s. Um, I can't think of that number off the top of my head, but that was the peak. And now it's a little bit down at 1.1 billion 
ounces. Uh, it's way down as a proportion of the monetary base, though. So there's that uh, slide. Um, you know, eventually I'll start to do articles on this. Now it's just tweets, but it's tweet 16 that you mentioned, uh, where you see in like the 70s and the 80s, the monetary base, which is a pers you know, which is uh, the main. Uh, it's the, it's the ultimate asset of settlement. Like it, that is when people say printing money, that is what, uh, that is what they mean. It's the central bank printing press. It's physical cash and currency and also bank reserves together. Um, right now it's about $25 trillion, which you see that's, that's the green on that chart. Uh, very small on the, on the left, very big on the right gold. Um, you will see as a, uh, percentage, and this is only the top, 30 by the way so it's sort of apple stabs because it's only looking at the top 30 floating currencies but gold you see as a percentage of that was much much higher in the uh, 70s and the 80s uh close to around 80 percent um compared to uh compared to now so compared to now it's you know it's down to five five, five seven percent and that's very interesting because um it shows that the market uh you know, can uh, central it, it, it central banks can get away with printing money in the market? You know, for some time believes in them. For how much longer? You know, no one really knows. But for some time, uh, they are getting away with uh, with with basically printing money uh, and having like basically no gold behind it. Now, of course, gold is not money. Not legally, you cannot redeem it. There's no connection. But they still hold gold. And I always think about that famous exchange that Ron Paul had with Ben Bernanke, you know, like, well, why do central banks hold gold? And Ben Bernanke responded like, oh, it's just tradition. It's just tradition. So he, they try to tell you that it's, uh, it's not money. It's not real value or anything. They try to tell you that, but of course they still hold it. And again, we don't even know how much they have. But yeah, it's just one perspective. Again, it's, it's interesting that uh, back in, you know, the very hyperinflationary days of the 70s, um, Gold was a bigger, much bigger percentage of central banks' balance sheets than now. Now it's uh, you know less less than ten percent. Um, so yeah, I can stop there. I don't know if if Stephanie wants to say anything or any other. Yeah, I think uh, Stephanie's questions tie in pretty good because I, uh, we also have some question about the, like I don't know what to call it. Like uh, Stephanie is like compound rate growth or something like that. And um, uh, first of all, let me just clarify. So the inflation rate of gold is approximately eight. What has been like one point eight percent, like two percent per year. Do one point eight. One point eight is pretty much the number. One point eight percent over about okay. two hundred years. All right. Do you number. think? Do you think, Matthew? I mean, do, do you think it's realistic? I mean, you know, finding more gold reserves. You know, in, uh, um, having more like whatever better mining technologies that this inflation rate could. You know, if the demand, especially, you know, increases, that eventually it goes beyond, way beyond the two percent uh, in the foreseeable future. You know, well, I mean, the example that uh, the Winklevoss twins are famously using these days is, you know, and pointing out, which is which is absolutely true, is that, um, you know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, everybody wants to start mining asteroids. Uh, that's a double edged sword that could work for certain things. But if it if it if, if we're thinking about preserving wealth, I mean, there's there's trillions and trillions of gold and silver in these asteroids that they want to mine. And if that comes down to Earth. Uh, that would absolutely collapse the price, which would be interesting uh, to see. But um, you, uh, you never know. I mean, it's a fun it's a function of supply and demand. Uh, gold bugs, you know, traditional Austrian economist Murray Rothbard, famously as well, like liked had a very big soft spot for gold because of that. But at the end of the day, uh, but at the end of the day, this is a key difference between gold and Bitcoin, is because Bitcoin we know we know there's only 21 million units. That is unlike. Certainly, unlike fiat, which we uh, point out in the in the uh, monetary base uh, update, but it's even unlike gold and silver because um, you know even though uh, we know that like yeah fixed in the Earth's crusts over billions of years uh, there is a fixed amount of gold and silver now today although there is some in sp in outer space and asteroids uh, let's just ignore outer space now even though it's fixed in the earth's crust it always increases like the, the you know it always increases it has happened to be a predictable rate of about 1.8 percent of the last 200 years um but it, it always increases so that's something that's very different than even uh than even than even bitcoin but not not even bitcoin right, it's very right. than bitcoin 
I remember even Eric Buskell saying, you know, it's it's not it wouldn't be that difficult to replicate or you know alchemistically, you know, like reproduce gold in a whatever way, nuclear, you know, plasmatic or <laughs> whatever technology. But you know, I mean, we haven't even found like we haven't really discovered or found or really went into the bottom of the you know oceans. Uh, 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 you yeah. know, for... it could be a comp, comp stock load uh, again. Absolutely, or these reserves, as you mentioned, in Russia, uh, and it has been done al alchemically, uh, as I understand. I, I am not an expert on this. I actually mentioned it in my interview with Adam Back, and he confirmed. And I, I've read it. I mean, I you, you might have read it too in passing. Like, yeah, it's extremely expensive, but it is possible it to is synthesize possible. Yeah. gold. Yeah. So uh, that's another. Thing. You know, Matthew, the, the reason I'm, I'm like uh, talking so much now about gold is because uh, I know, I mean, I'm very confident that one day uh, in the very foreseeable future, uh, gold is just going to be reduced to its utility function, whatever, for you, industrial technological purposes. And then, because you're saying in your Twitter thread that uh, Bitcoin uh, may become, you know, the global based money. So, but what are the conditions for that or what are the required necessary conditions? So, Okay. But Stephanie, go ahead with your questions and we can, you know, I can just. Yeah, thank you so much. That was uh, very enlightening. I really like your report. Uh, I could also learn quite some things. So I don't have questions on gold in particular, but um, one thing that I wanted to make clear, um, I wasn't aware so much about this compo com compound return approach, but as far as I understand, you were also mentioning it in tweet 62, you explained a little bit more on, on what you're doing. So you said that you are averaging things, um, or averaging the, the, inc the changes in the money supply within a month. And then you average all these months together within a year. And this is then what you're using as the compound changes per year. Is this correct? Correct. And um, you can compound any rate of return, right? So you could take a daily rate, uh, you could take a monthly rate, you could take a quarterly rate. And if you just uh, do, you know, the form is very simple, you know, one plus that rate raised to how many months it takes you to get to a year. So 12 in the case of what I'm doing, minus one, that will give you the comp, that is the formula for compound return. That is different than if I were to do that you know, that financial formula, that present value, future value, where you solve for the rate. Um, that would be the more precise, exact way to do it. It is true. Uh, I've compared it just because I, I, I'm a bit like, you know, the dollar, the dollar 50 years ago versus dollar today, the, 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 the difference is a few basis points between my method, which as you mentioned, it's taking all the months, averaging just the average month return and then compounding that to annual, you know, taking it to the 12th exponent, finding a compound return that way. If you did it, uh, the present value, future value, that's the financial function, the time value of money function, that would be like more precise. It's slightly different. The reason I do it that way though, however, is the, the reason I, I use the monthly compounding, as I mentioned, it's primarily for the two currencies and I hope to add more, which is going to happen more often. But the two biggest currencies in this exhibit are the, uh, the currencies of Argentina and the currencies of uh, Brazil. And in order to find a long-term compound growth rate of those using the traditional financial functions of present value, future value, solve for the rate of growth, it's actually impossible because a cruzado or a uh, new cruzado or whatever, Brazil had like six currencies, Argentina had five different currencies. If I would take that unit uh, in their monetary base in like the, six, in the 70s or in the 80s and compare it to the real, or the Argentinian peso today, it would be impossible because they're they're two different units. So uh, that's why I've settled on this monthly growth rate. And then in those cases of those currencies where the currency was just devalued, reset, zero slashed, I just ignore that month. And you'll you'll see it. Like if you actually look at the balance sheets of Brazil or Argentina, they do report their hyperinflations. Like I talk with uh, Max. Hillebrand about this a lot. It's one of the things I want to try to find is the actual money supply of the Weimar Republic. Maybe you guys can help out with this as well. You know, you can find lots of charts about the hyperinflation in Weimar of prices, right? But you can't find, at least I haven't found, the actual growth in the money stock. That's what I'm very curious about. Um, and I, I imagine it's in Deutsch. I don't, I don't think anyone has brought it to the English world 
Uh, so if you guys can help with that, please, please let me know. But, um, but yeah, the point is measuring the actual units. So it's not, it's not measuring like, uh, uh, you know, like how much a peso was worth 10 years ago in dollars versus now or anything like it's definitely just very consistent approach of units upon units upon units, how many are created. Uh, and the most precise, accurate way would be to use that present value, future up value function and solve for the dip, solve for the rate, but you just can't, you can't do that across all currencies. And, um, and so, so that's why I use this monthly compounding and it's very close. I mean, the, there is a discrepancy, but I've, I've checked it with, a, you know, the big ones like the dollar, the Euro over 20 years, a Euros has got some notes too, as we know, you're only started in 1999. I can explain if you want, but, um, uh, the discrepancy is, is small, but yes, I'm, I'm taking the monthly growth raising it to the 12th exponent, subtract one, and that will give you a compounded annualized figure, which is that figure that you can drive doubling time from. You can, uh, like, that's the figure that would compare to a government yield. It would compare to GDP growth. Like, yeah, you, you always want to try to find compound growth. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, even economists, because they just sort of think in terms of like annual growth or like, a, you know, like what's the latest year's growth of GDP. But if you want to look over like 10 years or 30 years or 50 years, and find a rate that is uh, comparable, that will allow you to compare what happened with other things across that time. That is that compound growth figure. So I really, I try to, I try to push people a lot, yeah, to, 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 to look at compound growth instead of just like, you know, uh, gross, like what's the, you know, the amount of dollars is 50 times higher than it was in, you know, 1980. Like that's less helpful because we use compound growth and the, the interest rate itself is a, that is a statement of compounding. That is a, that is a compounded figure. So when you hear like, you know, a 5% interest for a, uh, for a mortgage or uh, IRR internal rate of return, all these figures are rates of compounding as Thomas Jefferson, I think said was the eighth wonder of the world. So it, it is important. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. No, it's much clearer. Um, you really uh, differentiated between increases in the money supply and the increases in prices. And this was so, so well how you did this because so many people, when they analyze changes in the uh, purchasing power, they're looking at how to prices change but you were turning this whole thing around merely looking how the money supply changed and here it really makes sense to also use these compounding to measure different currencies across time and to cancel out also the hyperinflation so this is very very fascinating i, I actually don't know anyone else who does it like in this strict way so it's really mind-blowing <laughs> really cool thank you Sean. yeah thank you <laughs> Um, well, I have one more question. Um, in tweet six, you also noted that the actual money supply are the notes, the banknotes, and the reserves. And that's it. And all the M1, M2, M3 are claims on that. And I think this was also a very nice way on how to look at it. Um, I was writing an article where I made a balance sheet analysis and had a look on how money was created. And I found that the biggest entries on the liability side of the balance sheet are indeed the banknotes and the reserves, but they also have some other um, entries in there, like other liabilities, so which I would not count to the monetary base then. But um, like as far as I remember, like 80% of the whole balance sheet value was captured by the notes and the reserves. So this is... It's kind of when you look at the balance sheet um, value, this is kind of an estimate on the monetary base. But, you know, of course, you would need to have a closer look in this. And this is what I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. Did you um, check out different central banks if it's like always the case that this uh, monetary base is the majority of the balance sheet? Yeah, I haven't I haven't done a detailed analysis of that proportion. But uh, the, in principle, the answer is, is yes. And um, that will, that's coming. I'm, I'm, uh, it's a lot of data I'm trying to, to formulate and, and publish and maybe even, uh, yeah, ha have, have much more on, on the website in the future. But um, yes, those are, that is like the source of all the money now. And, and really quickly as well, so people can understand that is, the, as you mentioned, it's a liability on the central bank's balance sheet. So maybe confusing, right? Like, 
It's the money, but why is it a liability? And the reason for that, hopefully I can do this very quick explanation, is as we talked about gold and silver, uh, today's basic money, which has no connection to gold and silver, but today's basic money was yesterday's fiduciary media. And fiduciary media is always a liability for the one that creates it. So um, what is fiduciary media? That is the... Uh, Tickets, claims, checks, bankers, notes that uh, that the market creates by you know private interactions with inter individuals. That's fiduciary media. Uh, but so it was even with government notes before, uh, certainly before 1971. Well, kind of as we know, because only central banks could make the claim, could redeem. But certainly before 1935 and and into the 1800s. Uh, if you had, and you obviously, it's, you probably know a lot of economists show pictures of old notes where you can redeem for this amount of gold or silver. But if you took in that note, that ticket to the central bank or to any bank, uh, you could redeem in specie, you could redeem in real money, which was gold and silver. And so that's where that uh, accounting relationship, that's hopefully you see what I'm getting at. That's where it starts to make sense is like the real money has always been an asset. And by the way, Bitcoin is an asset too. So gold, silver, it always sits as an asset on the bank's books or the central bank's books. But if you, as the holder of that ticket, which can circulate as money, you want to redeem it for real money, then you go and, and, and you, you can do that. But from the perspective of the issuer, from the perspective of the bank, the central bank, that ticket is always a liability because they got to have on reserve the real money. So that's how that uh, works on the balance sheet. That's why it's always found on the liability uh, side, which I think you mentioned, you know, Stephanie, that's, that's like, it's important to point out, like, cause it's confusing for a lot of people, like why is base money a liability for a central bank? Why it's not an asset? It's just cause today's basic money was yesterday's fiduciary media. Like that's how, that's just how it's worked in the past is that those tickets really could be redeemed for gold, but now you can't redeem for anything. Now it's just government bonds that are on the other side, the asset side of their balance sheet. Uh, so it's a long-winded answer there. I still wanted to say though, um, there's one more item which maybe you had seen or, or thought about is the way that helicopter money, which we're now seeing in, in the real world, the way that that can get out into the economy is via the treasury. And the treasury does have an account with the central bank as well. Um, I don't know if you've noticed that as well. It's with like the Federal Reserve. It's huge now. It's over a trillion dollars. Some people are calling that base money, but that's that's actually uh, it's erroneous because that money is not in the banking system. So the reason that the reserves and the currency are base money, those two portions, because they are literally in the banking system. Like they circulate legally. They're legal tender for debts. Uh, a bank can issue credit uh, with the, with reserving some of those that money. So those are reserve. Those are all, the, the reserve, the bank reserves and the uh, physical currency. They're always and everywhere in the banking system. They're in, in the, uh, they're in the financial system. That's why they're based. And they're the, the top of it. They're literally like no bank can settle with another bank without doing some sort of a settlement with bank reserves. So that's that. Now there is this other thing that's happening, which used to be very small and used to be inconsequential, which is treasury accounts with their central bank are growing. And uh, you can see that it's called the TGA with the Fed, the Treasury General account. I'm not sure the latest, it's over a trillion dollars now, um, you know, where the, where the uh, monetary base is around 5 trillion of the United States dollar, for example, the Treasury account now is about a trillion. And that is uh, getting very close to hyper monitor, like hyperinflation uh, of, of uh, helicopter money style but basically, um, I'll try to do I, I wasn't sort of thinking I would talk about this. So I'm, I'll try to do it in a simple way. I think it's, 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 it's happening. I mean, it's happening every day. It's been happening since March. Um, is the Treasury normally would issue bonds and they just sell it to banks. Fed's not even involved. Central banks is not involved. The, the, the it's a primary auction market. They're just issuing bonds. Banks are buying it. Pension funds are buying it, whatever. If the Fed wants to get involved, wants to set the discount rate, everything, it comes into the secondary market, which is the repo market, as we know, or the open market oper operations. That's when they manipulate the money supply. That's when they buy. So they're buying like literally from the open market, from the banks. They're not buying from the treasury. Now that things are so severe and so serious, 
they are buying directly from the treasury. They are, they're like, they're taking the bonds, they're giving the treasury money. And that's a, that's a huge liability now of that printed money in their account. They're just doing it directly. And then what, ha- and then how does that money get into the money supply? Well, that gets in, sorry, it's, I don't have a curtain. It's sunny here, but um, thankfully at least it's sunny. It's, it's good to have some sunny days in this, these crazy times, but uh, the, uh, so you might be wondering, okay, that that's happening. This treasury general account is growing on the central bank balance sheet, but it doesn't actually get into the money supply until the treasury starts paying for stuff. So the, tre- the government, as we all know, doesn't do anything <laughs> in more ways than one. It doesn't do anything, but um, the, the, the only way that the government really can like intervene in the markets, or whatever is by paying for stuff. So when the treasury issues bonds, it's paying for stuff, but when it issues bonds and it gets that money directly from the Fed, which is that Treasury General account, and then it starts to pay for stuff. Like think about stimulus checks, uh, and I don't even know it goes. In, like I don't know if, if helicopter money has fully happened in uh, Europe now that I think of it. I know that there are these these COVID bonds, but I think have we gotten stimulus checks in Europe theoretically? I mean, I wouldn't get them, but I don't no, know. no, that would be like 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 unconditional like universal yeah, like basic income. Credit, like, yeah, crediting your account basically. No, no, it no, be that. a step of credit. Yeah, I don't think it ha- has happened yet, but that's ha- like they're literally in the U.S. now. There are checks that are going out signed by the treasurer, and people. So that that was directly money that just came from the Fed, like direct. And that's that treasury general account, which is now huge, Stephanie, it's, it's, to your point, it's, it's growing. It's another big liability portion. So that is the step when it gets into the money supply. And uh, once people deposit those checks, and, and, and this happens as well when the Fed, or when the treasury just pays for services, they start depositing those checks, then it gets into accounts, uh, broad money grows, and um, the money supply increases. That's why you see M1 now growing much faster than it did over like 2008 when only the monetary base was growing faster. And you might be wondering, well, if all this money is growing on the broader money, right? Like uh, you deposit the money, what about the basic money? What about are those reserve ratios now are out of whack? Because the reserve ratios for big banks used to be 10%, mid banks was three and a half percent. And actually small banks in the US, the US never had any reserve ratio. Well, since March, there's no reserve ratio. They have, mm-hmm. uh, they have stopped it. There is no reserve ratio at all. And I'm not saying that the Fed knows what the reserve ratio should be. Like they definitely don't. And I'm not also a, a fan of 100% reserve ratios. Like I don't think it needs to be 100%. But it's gone. There is no reserve ratio at all. So that helicopter money that's slowly sent out stimulus checks to the economy. That was that was directly created from the Fed, but it goes in a bit in a bit different way than it typically goes with central bank reserves and with um, just regular currency going into the economy. So, I uh, hope I didn't lose it. I, I myself was kind of going on something I was not planned to really say, but it goes to what you were saying, Stephanie, about the liability side of the balance sheet. It is those two things typically, just the bank reserves and the uh, currency. Now, treasuries are like directly get like this whole thing about Fed independence or central bank. It's all out the window because um, they're just working directly like treasury has a huge account. It gets the money in reserve form from the Fed. It's an, now the, the treasury has an asset. They also issued their bonds directly to the Fed as a liability for them. But then how does that money leak out in the economy? It leaks out in the form of those stimulus checks. Mm-hmm. And um they're going, there's no reserve ratio on them. So they're going, so I do, I mean, they, they have to be hyper, like not hyperinflation, but they, by definition, they have to be inflationary because there's, there's just nothing backing them on the other side, except for some demand for, uh, government bonds, but they're not even out in the market. I mean, the fed is buying it directly from the treasury. I'll stop there. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so I had a look in the annual report of last year and there the account of the treasury was less than one fourth. So it's one one to four around in regards to the reserve. So um, let's say it's um, one fourth that was the uh, treasury and three fourth was the reserves, but it was actually even more than three fourth the reserves. But now, as you say that, um, this ratio will probably change quite tremendously so that's very interesting to have a look at it um 
I also just um, checked that I found in the annual report of 2019 that Federal Reserve notes are obligations of the United States governments. So this is also something that changed completely. Before that, it was packed to gold, but now it's an obligation of the United States government. And how does the United States government get their revenue from if it's not money out of thin air? They get it through tax. So essentially, um, the Federal Reserve notes are backed through future tax payments. And so this whole dynamic has changed completely on what is a Federal Reserve note and what is fact. So this whole government structure is actually behind this whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's just went more and more crazy. Uh, not stopping. It really is not stopping. Yeah, let, let me go back to this um, original question I had. Like, um, And as you mentioned in your Twitter thread, um, Matthew, you, you said that Bitcoin might become or may become the global release based money. Now, if we zoom out a little bit and um, I don't know, maybe, maybe these points I'm going to mention is uh, might be irrelevant for our discussion. But as you've heard, like Iran has put out a decree or law that says, you know, the central bank or the national bank of, of Iran would uh, literally like buy or determine at what price they would buy directly from the Bitcoin miners in Iran in order to circumvent the sanctions and to buy, you know, uh, purchase uh, the imports. Uh, or pay for the imports. Um, and, you know, the FOMO that's been now, you know, in, in high gear now on, on every individual level, institutional level, ultranet, you know, rich people. Does that play into, you know, this elabor elaboration that you have, this, uh, you know, written out? Is, is that somehow relevant to your, to your discussion? Uh, we'll see. I think it does. I mean, certainly, I mean, Iran, Iran is surprisingly, I mean, uh, a lot of people probably don't know, but I mean, it is a top 30 floating currency. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not that uh, large, uh, as, as you could see, if you look at that spectrum of the different base monies that I that I report on this top 30, like really, you know, the top four or five are 90%, um, you know, the dollar, euro, yen, yuan, and, and pound. But, um, it is a huge. It is a, a huge currency relatively to the rest of the world, and uh, Iran is one of these countries that has had to deal with sanctions, like North Korea and and others. And yeah, they're going to try to do what they can, I think, to to get around it. I haven't seen it on the balance sheet yet. I'm mm -hmm. curious to see what it would look like on the balance sheet. Uh, their ba balance sheet is very precise in English. I mean, they show it. The hardest thing about this, a side note, the hardest thing about Iran's balance sheet is it's in the Persian calendar. It's in this like Muslim, like it's, it's, it's in a Persian, it's the old Persian. It's not the Muslim calendar, I should say, but it's, I don't know precisely the difference. Me neither. Persian. I'm not familiar, but and yeah, it's something like, I don't even know what year is would that be. But anyway, yeah, 1398 yeah. right now, uh -huh. but it's so that, so adjusting for that is, is actually kind of annoying, but it's, it's interesting there's a, I guess there's a slight difference between the Persian and the, the maybe the regular Muslim calendar. But anyway, there's the Persian calendar, and um, uh, they, uh, they, they're very clear on on what they report. I mean, they do it normally, just like anybody else. I know that there are some special laws in in in, uh, in you know in those certain religions that that have some restrictions on interest and things but they do report it the same way. So I presume Bitcoin would be there on the uh, left side, on the asset side of the balance sheet, even if they're printing money to buy it. Uh, it'd be interesting to see, it'd be interesting to see uh, how, how that will grow. Um, and Israel as well. I mean, you talk yeah. about politics, right? I mean, you have two nations that historically don't quite uh, get along. Uh, it's very interesting to see that Bitcoin is a unifying factor. Right. Uh, between the two of them, I think. Uh, so it's not a direct answer, I guess, to your question, but there's certainly some interesting things. Well, yeah, because you said uh, something about reservists. I mean, Iran, do you think the Iranian government or the National Bank of Iran like like deliberately like wants to keep a low profile? They, they, want it, they don't want to name it like it's a reserve asset. Um, but what if, you know, it, it triggers sort of a competitive jurisdictional arbitrage, whatever you call it, like like more governments, more national, national banks, uh, you know, FOMO in into this reserve asset FOMO, you know, like, like, would, do you, do you see that coming? Like, well, everybody's, everybody's uh, speculating that it's going to come some, mm -hmm. at some time, you know, if it's a Caribbean bank um, or an Iranian, you know, Iranian bank or the bank of Iran. 
um, or, you know, North Korea, we know has been mining for a long time. I mean, there's certain, there's certain, uh, things that just are going to keep happening no matter what the, you know, the powers that be say. So, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I, I just, I like, I certainly like tracking it and seeing, uh, the changes, but, um, you know, it's like, and I've said this before, and I'm sure you guys have as well, like what happened with uh, Michael Saylor um, and and MicroStrategy and like, and even Square. I mean, I did not see that coming. I did not see this boost in a corporate treasury asset this year being Bitcoin. Certainly he's made the biggest splash, but there are others, uh, not just Bitcoin companies. And um, that will absolutely uh, continue and the fact that it's happening both on the corporate level and now on the international exactly. level. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting. But I don't know. I wonder what you guys think as well. I see in Europe more, um, more regulatory uh, hurdles as far as like a personal account with Bitcoin. With Bitcoin. Um, you know, I've, I've just, on some chats and things that I'm, I'm in, you know, I've, I've seen things where like a bank, I didn't even mean like Deutsche Bank. I can't remember. DB Nord. It was like, they're starting again to, you know, I know in Germany now for a while, like for a year, it's been like Bitcoin banking or crypto banking is, is like law, right? I mean, you can do it. Um, but I'm starting to see much more about the regulatory capture of like this stuff, like take a screenshot of your wallet or show, you know, very invasive on your personal privacy. This is actually your coins and not the coins of someone else. So I don't know what you guys think about that. I, I see Europe as being very more, especially much more Netherlands. I mean, isn't that like the, uh, what is it called? Biotonic, uh, 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 um, something like that. They, they require the central bank of Netherlands requires um, uh, an exchange to, uh, you know, to have its customers like prove or validate the, that it's really their wallet that they're using or something. I mean, it's really pretty, <laughs> intrusive and uh, yeah so i don't know how it's going to evolve you know uh generally in the european union yeah yeah your guess is as good as mine yeah so what i saw in the last weeks and months is that they are trying to make more and more regulation less privacy and also more um tax on it so that you always have to make a wealth tax or something um so these are things that are in discussion but i mean if you look at the incentive structure it's quite obvious that the um, governments don't like bitcoin so um and i think there could be more to come um that they're trying with prohibitions but they will not completely do this i mean you cannot prohibit that it's the the protocol of course you cannot mm -hmm. um but it would make it uh, more difficult to use it as a currency so um they can do something i'm curious how far they go or whether they say okay now we adopt bitcoin i think it very much also depends on which country you're looking so the smaller countries are more likely to rather adopt bitcoin than to fight it and to make get an advantage of that so uh, but we see how it turns out in the future so i expect everything <laughs> yeah yeah and it's very it's very mixed signals in the, in the U.S. too. Although I do I do see much less invasive, like personal intervening than I see in Europe. Um, and I have kind of a foot in both waters, as you might know. I, you know I, my, my my mixed mixed parents, uh, Latvian and American. But the uh, uh, you know, like what happened in uh, in in uh, Wyoming, giving a, a banking license to Kraken was was amazing. And then two weeks two weeks later, you have the uh, uh, the Department of Financial Services in New York and the FBI and the Department of Justice, like trying to, you know, throw criminal charges at the uh, founders of BitMEX. Like those are two, you know, conflicting things in the course of two weeks. That's very, you know, okay. It's like, all right, we know we can't control this, but we're going to regulate the hell out of it. And yeah, if you're good, you're going to get a banking license. Like it's very, um, it's very, it's, it's, you know, and I'm all for Bitcoin privacy. Like I certainly want it to be there uh, as much as it can on a protocol level with being, you know, obviously there's all debates, debates about that, about keeping the protocol like sound and, and safe. But I mean, yeah, it's mixed signals. It's mixed signals. And, and it's like with such uncertainty in the world, um, you know, I think like you said, 
Stephanie, I, I don't think it's going to stop. I think, I think it will definitely, it's going to keep coming. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something to, I don't know how to like ex- neatly summarize the, my last train of thought here, but it's, it's kind of like, you know, there's a debate even in the Bitcoin world where, uh, you had really relative, relatively well known Bitcoiners like Trace Mayer, who kind of was not really promoting, uh, coin mixing, but just promote, promoting self-sovereignty, right? And then you have plenty of other Bitcoiners that are promoting the hell out of coin mixing and 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 uh, coin joins and and uh, you know Lightning also is an anonymizer. Yeah. So, um, you know, I can see, and this is nothing new that I'm saying. Like we, we know that this is a topic that has been coming, and it might even become some sort of a debate on the protocol level. I don't think it's there at all yet, but. Um, you know, this debate versus like, if it's just sovereign, like if you know that it's yours and you know that you can send it to a bank that's regulated, or if you truly can like have it be yours and then like, you know, gift it to your nephew or niece or whoever, you know, in a purely like self-sovereign liberty fashion, like you can't a gold coin really. Uh, that's what they're, that's really what they're coming after. And what I actually realized when I went deeper into Bitcoin that through Bitcoin, I realized the importance of privacy. And now I'm like all in for privacy. I'm paying everything in cash because I just don't want that my bank knows everything. Mm-hmm. Although yeah. I'm buying vegetables for that, so <laughs> no, nothing big. But yeah, privacy has become more and more important. I'm also like trying to have my conversations like secure um, and to end encrypted, even if it's just a random conversation. And also I'm using more privacy, protecting browsers, um, just as a principle. I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. What do you think about the central bank digital currencies playing into this? I mean, this whole push of Lagarde, you know, the uh, former criminally convicted (laughs) president of the European Central Bank pushing for the digital euro and uh, central bank digital currencies. And the UK has been researching it longer Mm -hmm. than anyone uh, in China as well. Um, it, it will be another form of base money. It would be, it would be you know, it would be the third rail of basic money if they could pull it off. Uh, I've said this a long time. I'm not, I don't really, again, I'm, I'm trying to, try to, I'm still in the phase of my life where I'm doing a lot of research with numbers and I'm not writing too many articles. Maybe that will come at some point. But I have thought and I have said for a long time that, you know, I mean, like we've seen that the government cannot like put together a healthcare like website without it getting you know hacked or problems and, and anything i really do doubt the the soundness of a, of, a, of a central bank digital currency not being a technologist myself i really doubt the soundness of it and like some hacker in just a place that doesn't even care about that you know it, say it's like a caribbean country who's like hiring you know some third rate uh uh you know joe to to code it up doesn't really matter how much security you have. There's always going to be some actor. It could be a state actor. It could be someone who doesn't like you. That's going to come after it. So I really have a hard time seeing how they take off from like I don't know, a kind of a fa- like a sound technical level. Again, not being a technologist myself, what I do think they could do very much is to regulate the hell out of these uh, stable coins, which are very successful. I mean, stable coins, even though you know. You could be in Pluto and know that there's still some issues going on with Tether. <laughs> I mean, from at least the soundness of like this relationship with Bitfinex, whatever. I, I shouldn't, I'm not saying there is like, I'm not saying like take my money, money out of Tether or whatever, but like, you know, everybody's got to make their choice about, mm. you know, Tether is clearly not base money like Bitcoin uh, because there are dollars and bonds and some other assets, maybe a loan from Bitfinex that is backing the thing that is called the TUSD. But that is something that works. It's private. It's like a banking system within Bitcoin or within the world of crypto. And so I do think that those protocols, those projects, those coins, those institutions that surround them, they could very easily get. And as we've seen, like about a year ago, I guess it was about a year ago, there was another big uh, injunction. I don't know, this request from the NYDFS to Bitfinex and Tether at all, all these people that are connected, trying to get more information, um, you know, and, te- and Tether does well. I mean, Tether has gotten through the storm. I'm not, I have no idea of the state of like uh, Bitfinex's 
vis-a-vis tethers sort of soundness. But, you know, those are, I'm fine with those like individual market actors making those choices, but the governments will not be. They see it low hanging fruit that they can take advantage of. They can regulate. And even though that is not base money, that would be, you know, some sort of just managing, it's like managing a bank, right? It's, it's not, that's not base money that's in those stable coins. At least there's some circular economy that's circulating around with those that I think they would like to regulate. So I do think that will become, that's coming like really, really fast and it's just going to, you know, that that's going to be regulated before any sort of really legitimate central bank digital currency. Yet, if they could pull it off, yeah, it would simply be like it's a digital form of a cash that that cash that they create on their balance sheet. Uh, yet they can sort of control it more digitally, close you out if they don't like what you're spending on all those things that we fear, like with the Orwellian, Orwellian state. But I'm skeptical. I'm, you know, again, not being a technologist myself, I'm very skeptical that they can pull off. I mean, we have these theories like checks in, again, Europe is way past this Mm -hmm. with STEPA, which was a goodwill project, which actually worked pretty well between European nations. But, uh, you know, U.S. is 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 a wash in checks still, as as I just told you, the stimulus checks. Like, it, it's it, the check is a like a three hundred year old invention. I mean, and we still are using it like in the digital the digital age. So I think that um, I, I think that check. Oh, not not I think there there's plenty of research like checks could go on for like thirty more years in some form in the U.S. So if we're talking about like checks going on, like how, how are they going to get a central bank digital currency? I don't know. That's just me. I'm, I'm very skeptical. Maybe a country like China, which is like just going to batten it down and like, you know, it's a separate economy, really hardcore, try to engineer it and not let anybody in somehow, even though it's digital, like behind their firewall, whatever. Maybe they can pull off something. But um I'm skeptical. I am skeptical about the success of CBDCs. Yeah, I really liked your mentioning that there could be software hacks. I didn't think about this before, but I would be like super excited if these things happen. Yeah. Uh, rather looking at this from an economic perspective, that more and more people realize now that our fiat money system is actually a Ponzi scheme and um, the CBDCs are as well. And the money only has a value because people attribute value to this money. And if they know they, that they can print infinitely, then actually it doesn't have value. So I would give uh, the fiat money no value from this point of view, but I do give it value right now because others give fiat value and I can use it for buying goods and paying my rent right now. But I see that this will change more and more. People just realize um, that this is not a sound monetary system and we're, we are becoming more, the Bitcoiners get more and are spreading the word. Uh, so uh, if they introduce the central bank digital currencies, I think they could be there for maybe months, years, but they will eventually collapse when enough people again realize that it's just um, not a sound money and then they will go to another system. Yeah, the only thing that they have at the end of the day to enforce it, to enforce that fiat, that decree is... Um is the legal, you know, legal tender laws specifically with money. But then, you know, as many Austrian libertarian philosophers go, I mean, the farther back you go, I mean, just it's the government license. I mean, that's the problem. Like only central banks are the ones with the monopoly to print some sort of media that can f- circulate as money. And as a lot of free market economists who I really enjoy, like Dr. Selgin, Dr. White, Kevin Dowd, I mean, there's plenty of examples where there need not have been a central bank or government interference for a monetary system to work can totally work without that Uh, bitcoin was an invention outside of the government and as you said more and more people are getting involved and um i think that the um the the history is pretty clear right when there's something good, good there's an invention that's good the government will try to take it over, to co-opt it. They usually make it slow. They turn it into like a utility. You know, I mean, they, they, everybody needs it. Everybody should have some some piece of it. And uh, they try to they try to just make it something where, you know, everybody has access. But that usually comes at the expense of reliability and soundness and speed and, uh, and quality and price. Um, if not more nefarious things like, 
special interests and uh, some crony capitalism and people, you know, getting mixed up with the wrong characters uh, behind the scenes in, in, in government. So, um, and then of course, you can go even farther. I mean, like, you know, they are the ones that, you know, if you don't pay your taxes, you know, you, you don't want to know what happens to you when you don't pay your taxes. You have to pay your taxes. So um, they're going to give it all they got. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, um, well, the monetary system is actually uh, a monetary system without a central authority is actually much better because what are they doing right now, these central banks? They are artificially reducing the interest rates, um, even to negative interest rates, which from a human action, proxiological kind of viewpoint does not make sense. It's not logical. And apart from that, this is the reason why we have boom and bust cycles, why we have so much misallocation of resources, why we have so incredible high inflation that the assets rises uh, rise so incredible that um, especially young people are reliability and soundness and speed and uh, and quality and price, um, if not more nefarious things like special interests and uh, some crony capitalism and people, you know, getting mixed up with the wrong characters uh, behind the scenes in, in, in government. So, um, and then of course you can go even farther. I mean, like, you know, they are the ones that, you know, if you don't pay your taxes, you know, you, you don't want to know what happens to you when you don't pay your taxes, you have to pay your taxes. So um, they're going to give it all they got. That's, that's for sure. All right. I got a, I got kicked out for the last two minutes or so. Can you guys hear, still hear me? <laughs> it's not logical. And apart from that, this is the reason why we have boom and bust cycles, why we have so much misallocation of resources, why we have so incredible high inflation that the assets rises uh, rise so incredible that um, especially young people are very frustrated because they they cannot buy a house ever and they are kind of stuck in the system and the uh, gap between rich and poor increases um, and the whole system becomes more unstable. And so uh, actually uh, another monetary system would solve all the problems, although they say that printing more money would solve the problem of uh, a, a, a mal-working economy, which is just untrue. It's just... Um, some crazy uh, theory that was put in place to justify their means. And what they're doing is they're essentially taking over the economies, controlling and steering the economy, and like literally buying up assets with uh, money printed out of thin air. I mean, that's criminal. Yeah. <laughs> they're doing this as their whole system, which we are all using. It's just, it's just beyond. <laughs> yeah. And as a, uh... As Milton Friedman said, and I, I like Milton Friedman for some for some stuff. I know a lot of Austrians don't don't like him. I'm not a fan of the monetarist like ideology, but the um, he was correct when he said, you know, that the there will when you have government involved, you will always have the unholy alliance of the uh, do-gooders on the one side and the special interests on the other. And as I was alluding to, and I think you mentioned, you know, as, are alluding to as well. You know, that's where you get this malaise this crony capitalism this uh, inefficiency and in some cases just downright like i mean like immoral behavior whereas if you were a private actor in the market providing some service whether it be money or anything i mean and you failed to provide it or you uh were fraudulent you know you would just be quickly quickly pushed out of the market whereas we, we just cannot push them out of the market and uh yeah that's that's the world we're in. They actually have the monopoly on fraud as well. And yeah. Hans Hoppe was um, saying this so nicely that when you have this democracy, you have the special interests, the lobbyists that come and everyone wants to get as much from the pie, from this redistribution pie. And then this is forced on the rest. And actually what we see is that we have these lobbyists working together with the politicians. And I mean, this is also already like mainstream. Also the mainstream people know that. Um, and what is actually also working behind the scenes is that this whole construct is working together with the financial system to get cheap money to do their means. And this is also more and more coming more visible right now. Um, for example, I mean, um, bonds are bought from Siemens, Allianz, and all the big corporations, they profit. But you know, the small shop next door cannot profit from super cheap debt. 
So it's always the big business that is profiting from all that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. And, uh, we're seeing it with, uh, with, well, yeah, with COVID, I mean, only essential items can be sold or non, you know, items that aren't competing with other, in, you know, mom and pop shops or whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's at the worst possible time to regulate such a thing. And, you know, it, it, it only hurts the consumer. It only hurts the consumer. Yeah. And the chain reaction of damages, you know, collateral damages, the second, third degree effects, the 800, I think there are 800,000 zombie companies in Germany. I think Dr. Markus Kral said that. Wow. The, the 800,000, like, you know, sort more or less like bankrupt companies in Germany. You know, I mean, it's, it's like a quarter of all companies in it. So I don't know what, what's going to come up. You have, like you have like a study on that. I would, I would be interested. To yeah. I mean, if there's a study, I'll send you that definitely. But uh, you know, we did like really uh, the, the guy's one of the greatest experts, Dr. Kral. I mean, he's a gold bug, but you know, we love him for his work. Mm -hmm. He's really great. He's Austrian economist, uh, like Dr. Torsten Pollett also. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately I got kicked out <laughs> from zoom. I don't know. I even changed my location with 300 megabits, but still, you know, I got kicked out. So, so anyway, I got to really listen to that. Uh, the, the few minutes that I got kicked out, but what if you know still going back to bitcoin i think it's it's so astonishing which you which you elaborated in your twitter thread it's like the 10th largest money x uh gold and silver but with gold and silver it's 12th uh 12th yeah, one, rank. Now, one spot up now after this this price boom yeah it's past uh russia, it's past russia. <laughs> that's and amazing right about now right about this level i think i'm pretty sure it's it's at canada Canada does crazy things. They're they're they've gone really up and down with their balance sheet, but I think it's right about 18k uh, where Canada sits at the moment. <laughs> uh, you know, keep yeah, it's, yeah, it's about 18k. It's about 18k. So Amazing. we'll see. We'll see. Now, I, I I only count those at month end, so we'll see at next quarter uh, where where Bitcoin sort of stands, but. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible, um, and I, it's yeah, it's catching on. I saw the girl from Game Game of Thrones. Did you see that Macy Williams? She put out a poll: should I should I buy Bitcoin or not? And it's <laughs> a huge poll. I mean, it's massive. Like like you know, because she's got like millions of followers. And That's a wonderful it was, meme. <laughs> forty. It was forty seven percent yes, fifty three percent no. It's very interesting. Uh, Matt, I mean, just massive for for the, the attention to bitcoin like someone so sort of really mainstream you know young girl should she invest in her financial future a little bit in bitcoin and she's and she at, after the poll she's like thanks for the uh thanks for the support i bought some anyway or something <laughs> it was, that was 47 percent only yes and so it's, yeah it's pretty cool it's pretty cool it's unfortunate though during this time as you say like yeah i really don't like and i never liked the uh the bent that some people go with like you know it's None of us want like financial collapse to bring about, you know, uh -huh. the thing that we believe. And unfortunately, that's just how it seems to happen. Well, it's not going to be frictionless. I mean, that's what we know for sure. But with, you know, we want it, we wish it to be as as smooth and frictionless as possible. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, besides the number go up, technology and this whole FOMOing. It is, I mean, I see, fortunately, it's really good news that so many, uh, even amongst the you know, macro investors, you know, even one of the richest billionaires in Mexico got like, I think if it's true, like 10% of its net assets in Bitcoin now or is, you know, so it's good that, you know, the comprehension is kicking in, 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 in a lot of, you know, on every level, like what it, what Bitcoin really means, you know, out of necessity. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I have one more question. It was on your tweet 51. Sure. That you were mentioning the silver price because many say, yeah, that silver is actually undervalued. And you mentioned um, uh, a mean how to how to say that it's actually not overvalued. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this. So I think it started in the 49 the, and then um, ended at the 51. That would be awesome. Yeah, sure. So I, I tried to uh, do it, you know, subtly, whatever. I mean, I, I, I took on a little bit of uh, some gold bugs there. I took on some silver bugs. Um, <clears throat> the one thing, I'll start with gold, actually. I know you asked about silver, but the one thing that uh, gold bugs like to say is they like to say that uh, if you take out all of the 
you know, industrial uses of silver, which is indeed uh, a lot. It's over 50%. You take out all the industrial usage of silver, both on the uh, stock side and on the flow side. Um, actually, on the, I should say only on the, uh, on the, st on the stock side. Uh, you will um, get to a very, very low stock to flow for silver, right? Something like three or four. And I understand that. I understand what they're doing. But what they are doing is, yes, discounting the whole stock of silver way down, taking out, um, taking out all the industrial uses of silver, all in, in, in wires and electronics and, and everything. Uh, but they're also taking out the silverware and the jewelry. They're taking out everything and they're leaving it only with bullion, which admittedly is a very small portion of silver bullion in the world, coins and bars. There's a few central banks that still hold it, very small. Um, and, they're, and, and then just private silver. You know, silver you can buy with gold money or whatever, silver eagles. Um, and then take that full flow. They take the full flow, the full annual production of silver. All right, so a very small stock and a, so a very small discounted stock with the full flow which goes into not just bullion, but into industrial, into silverware, into other things. Um, and they say, okay, well, silver is not very good as a, as a hedge or investment because it's got a stock to flow of three. And then they always, in the same breath, quote the gold stock to flow of 60, which is, it's not, in my, I, in my complete understanding, I, I, very tr I get this data from Nick Laird. He's an expert in uh, the gold and silver business. He knows all the people. He publishes this data. I purchased it from him. It's not, it's not 60. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's like 55. That's, that's the number. But anyway, uh, so in the same breath, gold bugs will say silver is a stock to flow of three, but gold is 55. But what they're doing in that comparison is not discounting out all of the industrial usage of gold and all of the jewelry in gold, because there's a huge portion of the gold stock that's in jewelry. It is true that the gold bullion, coins and bars, proportionally is more than silver. Uh, it's like maybe 30% for gold and like 3% for silver. I'm, I'm not as sure exactly on those numbers, but it's very, you know, it's, it's true that there's more percentage wise, more coins and bars, more bullion for gold and silver. But you got to be apples to apples. So that was that slide. 48 if you want to look at that where i have all these different stocks and flows like i can give you a stock to flow of three for silver if you want but if you're going to say that silver stock to flow is three you better quote that comparable one for gold and that is 21 it's 21 so take out if you're going to discount everything all the industrial all the the silverware take everything out but bullion do the same thing for gold and you're going to get a different number so you can do you can you can play around with all those numbers and that's so let me let me let me clarify that Pat. Yeah. so this this whole stock to flow ratio of gold that you always even even safid on the in his book of 62 or 58 or approximately 60 I, is wouldn't I that be five but yeah okay yeah sorry go ahead no no go ahead so, so that would mean that's not correct then no, no. It, it, like as I, I, I have it on my phone here, you know. But the uh, if you look at that slide 50, uh, 48, you see one, two, three, four, five, six different ways <laughs> to calculate okay. the stock gotcha. flow. Gotcha. So one is you know all time. One is discount industrial uh, usage, right? Which is much different, much more definitely, no doubt. Take out from silver than gold. Next one is discount jewelry, uh, and then uh, next one is well. Uh, I mean, did I just do there? Oh, that's fine. I just did one over time and then one over a year. But yeah, basically all time, take out industrial, take out jewelry. Those are the, those are the differences. And you can do them for either. You can get, but my point was you always hear, and this is not just uh, Bitcoin bugs. Uh, uh, yes, I have heard Savedin do that, does this. You know, he's been on our show. It's fine. I, I know that he has a soft spot for gold, but many people do that in the gold industry. It's not, it's not just him. Uh, so my point is, if you're going to quote silver with a stock to flow of three or four, it's closer to four as I calculate it, then you better in the same breath note that gold's 21 in that okay. analysis. Interesting. That, that's, just, that's apples to apples comparison. Okay, so that's gold. So those were my, that was my beef with gold bugs. Now with silver, as you mentioned, uh, Stephanie, that, that for years, for years, we've heard that silver, you know, because gold, gold price relative to silver is like 100x you know it's 80x now something but it's it's always been like m massive discrepancy in the last 20 years and this has particularly been a meme for the last 10 years and that silver bugs are like well 
it's got to go back to its pre, you know, it's, it's historical ratio. Like the natural, the mining ratio is like nine. The natural ratio is like 17, like the actual crustal ratio relatively. I think the, you know, those just the Roman ratio might've been like 15. So whatever, 12, nine, you know, it's 80. Now, if you look at the price, it's 80. So say if, you know, it's going to go back to like 16, that at least means they you know, divide those two ratios. That at least has got to be a five X bump in silver relative to gold. So if gold's going to, this was also pre Bitcoin. So a lot of like gold bugs were doing this, but like if, if the monetary system is going to explode, if gold is going to explode in price because of it, silver is going to do five times better or 10 times better because it's way undervalued relative to gold based on the price. However, the simple thing that those uh, silver bugs are ignoring, and again, this is market. I, I don't know what the market will do, but I'm just saying, let's hold the 16 to one. I think the 16 to one was the number I used. Let's hold that number as gospel, right? 16 to one should be the ratio, not uh, 80 to one, right? But let's hold 16 to one as the ratio. Well, in reality, we're even below that right now because you're not looking at the actual cap, the market cap of silver, the value. Uh, you, you can't just look at price because price is just on one individual unit. But let's look at the actual, all the supply that's out there in the world today. And I think that I'm just to read what I quoted, right? So the all time, if the, we can do two numbers here. All time today, relatively, the value of gold in the world is about $11.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. Silver is 1.3. So that's a ratio of nine. So if you want to go to back to that ratio of that's the, that is actually, it's always been that way. That's, that's called the mining ratio. It's a ratio of nine. So we're already there. First of all, I mean, forget the price of being 80 X a hundred X, right. That you see the stocks, the supplies, the, the, sorry, the stocks are, at a ratio of nine. So if you want to get to that price ratio of like 15 or 16, I think the number that I used was 16, that ratio, you got to actually decrease the silver price. You got to decrease it. You get, silver would have to fall. You'd have to get, you know, again, you hold gold constant. You have to hold gold constant to do this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the gospel, presumably that the gospel is the ratio. So if, if gold is 11.7 and that's a ratio of nine, well, if you want to get to ratio of 16, holding gold constant, you got to decrease the market cap of all time silver to get to a ratio of 16. Does that make sense? So you have to, might, might have botched uh, my explanation of that a little bit at the end, but basically we're already there. Like it's just a different lens, right? All of the, what has been said for 10 years by silver bugs of the Silver's way undervalued compared to gold because it's, you know, gold is 80 times more expensive in price. They're not looking at the underlying supply that's out there mm -hmm. in the world. You got you to multiply the price by the units and then the picture becomes much clearer. Then the, and that's the ratio we should do. So you could do it at the all time or you could even take away the industrial, which I did. And so if you take away the industrial, uh, then you're about $10 trillion in gold. Mm-hmm. And uh, 0. 0.7 uh, trillion, 700 billion in silver. And if you do that math, 10 trillion, 10 divided by 0. 0.7, right? You're already basically at 16. Again, just say, assuming 16 is the gospel number. So you like the minus 5% move in price, still down. <laughs> so silver, remarkably, is close to the historical ratios of whatever you want to say, 9, 12. 15, 16, it's right at it. You're just not, you don't, you can't look at the price difference of $2,000 an ounce versus $20 in silver, which is not, I know it's a, that's a hundred extras. You can't look at the differences in price. You have to actually look at all of the stock together to try to understand what those ratios mean. And again, I'm not saying that it stays there. I'm not saying that like next week, the ratio might bounce. Of course, only the market knows that, but it's just, it's just a little, it's a little, uh, it's a little calling out of some gold and silver bug uh, treatment that that that's typically given. Uh, and again, and not not because I have no problem with gold. I have no problem with silver. <laughs> it's not that 
uh, I want to try to cheerlead for one or the other. I like them all and I like Bitcoin. But there's, it's just interesting where people like to kind of harp on certain pieces of data with not uh, really providing the full picture was, was my point there. And I think I, I probably talked way too long on that answer, but sorry. No, fascinating. So uh, let, me, let me just, uh, uh, let's just hold, hold, hold on for a second here. So the market capitalization of Bitcoin right now is, is nothing. I mean, it's like a drop on a hot stone, like $350 billion. Is there... Do you see like a pivotal point, like a critical tipping point where it could go like by order of magnitude and exceed even the market? I don't know what to call it, market capitalization of gold of 10 trillion. And what would happen then? Because that could happen really fast. Your, your guys' guess is as good as mine. But I, I, think, I think what is happening, those, uh, those booms, and then, you know, I don't want to say busts, right? But these booms and then sort of cooling off periods. Uh, no one knows what was really happening with gold and silver, right? I mean, when they were sort of becoming monetized, becoming commoditized, uh, we, we don't really have data on that. Um, we do for Bitcoin. It's very interesting, right? I mean, we have just, you know, and I don't know if it's a function of like every four years, you just have 16 year olds that want to spend mommy and daddy's money. And they sort of see, you know, it's just a function of 16 year olds every four years, sort of kind of coming into the financial world and, and, and knowing that Bitcoin is so much more logical and rational than even gold and silver, even though I have no problem with gold and silver. I don't know if that's the reason, but it, it, it seems to be every three or four years that we have these booms. So, um, and they're certainly exponential, right? I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was nothing for for 10 years and then bitcoin passed like virtually every currency in the world in 2017 i mean it was already it's actually cuz canada was lower in 20 uh in 2017 uh when that when that peak happened at 20,000 and even though there was less bitcoins around in 20 in, in 2017 it was at 20,000 the market cap it, it did peak at about 9 so we're at we're back at 9 although russia is the one below canada's above we're, we're including gold and silver, we're, tw we're 11. Sorry, I shouldn't say too many numbers. Let's just count fiat, right? Uh, Bitcoin was at nine. It, it ranked number nine in 2017 at the peak. It just blew past all of them. And then it stayed there, basically fell back down a little bit, but stayed at that number now for the last three years. So again, I mean, I, I don't... I. I predicting supply and demand is difficult and, and, and amidst a financial crisis or a, a global pandemic, of course, but it, it seems that the growth of such an asset requires an exponential sort of boom because, uh, because of a variety of factors. And that's just, that seems what it does. Do I think that it will blow past like gold in one run? I probably, you know, absolutely not. But I do think, you know, if you see it, blow past 20,000 and then go to like 100,000, maybe 200,000. Mm -hmm. Certainly could do that. It's still going to be below uh, the top four currencies is that at that number. Uh, let me just quickly get the pound. What's the pound? That's a good one. So the pound is 60K. Mm -hmm. pound is 60K. So once it blows past the pound at 60K, there's only the top four currencies left. And... Um, I don't think it will hit them during this run at all. You know, it'd have to be, you know, somewhere around 200, 250,000. Okay. So I, I think maybe it gets, maybe it gets somewhere up there close, but then I think it, it pulls back. I, again, not financial advice. I'm just, just talking here, but based on these past booms and then sort of cooling off periods, uh, I, I don't see why, uh, it's past, you know, the South Korean won, the Russian ruble. Why it, it can't just blow past the, the loony, the uh, the Swiss franc, or or the British pound and the Indian rupee as well while it's doing it. And by the way, it would pass silver as you as we've talked about about thirty six k. That's available silver. That's all the silver in the world, including silverware, including jewelry, including bullion, because that's all the liquid silver. As least as I believe you should measure it. Um. So yeah, only. After you get above 60K, the only thing that remains are the top four currencies in gold. Um, so I definitely think, I, I think it, it'll make a run here this next time, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Who, who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe it blows up to 250, 300 in the next run and then, then cools back, but. 
by that time, this is always my question. It's like we are, we're thinking, constantly thinking, comparing, denominating in fiat. By that time, when it goes to whatever amount, like 200, 300, 500,000, are we really, are we really going to compare that in fiat? Are we really going to think or are we like measuring like as a unit account in Satoshi's because yeah, it's the purchasing exactly. power, you know, that's exactly. going to come. I put that actually in the um, in the notes is that I think as that uh -huh. is that multiplier uh, the notes of my table as that multiplier goes towards one uh, of basically the uh, you know the value of Bitcoin instead of being like ninety nine x smaller than uh, than fiat but if it goes to basically one yeah I don't see why we wouldn't at least start to have other people understand things in the unit of a, of Satoshi or the unit of a of a BTC. For sure. I think that's a great point. And I think that has to happen in the next 10 years. But these are glacial things. These definitely are, are slow. Um, I, th I think that has to happen. All right. Matthew, I really love that talk. We could I could talk to, with you, you know, for hours and Stephanie, I'm sure you too. So Matthew, any final thoughts or I'm really looking forward for your next report and been listening to your interviews lately. It's, it's mind blowing. So any final thoughts where, where people can find you? No, well, actually, one more. Sorry, uh, you had, you put it uh, put it in my head there when you were talking about Satoshi's. Um, another thing, which is uh, again contrary to like a subjective value and a lot of Austrian theories, a lot of people like to use uh, the phrase like "money is a measuring stick," and this is also what I'm not trying to do here. Um, the uh, the the idea, like you said, of like the dollar is a measuring is, is kind of a measuring stick, sorry, the unit of account that we use uh, globally today, dollars reserve currency, whatever we use that that term. But really, it's just one way to kind of set the stage. Like I could do this in Japanese yen, I could do it in uh, you know Chinese yuan. Um, it's going to mean different things to different people at different times. I could do it in gold ounces. Um, so I can't do it in Bitcoin, though, because actually it wouldn't make sense, right? You'd have to have like, you'd have some number over 21 million. So that's an interesting thing. It's only going to make sense, as you said, once that number is at one. Once it's at one, the ratio is at one, then you could start to do it because there's actually so many units of base money more than Bitcoin. You can't actually do it in Bitcoin yet. It, it wouldn't make sense. But uh, the point is that money is measuring stick is, is a term. Fernando and I talk about that a lot. We, we've heard some people make it uh, at like some... Bitcoin conferences, like, you know, comparing different things. Uh, it's, it's a subtle thing, but like, you know, goods can only be compared ordinarily at any time by the individual actor, right? It's like you're at the baker, you want the loaf of bread more than you want the, the euros. The baker wants the euros more than the loaf of bread. I can make a panel of prices and talk about bread, but if the bread goes bad if it expires like what, what does it matter you know like and and, and th there's no doubt there's a lot of that going on in this chart like i'm doing my best to try to be like consistent and like you know we talked about these different stock the flows but uh there is actually no concept of, of money as a measuring stick like I'm, I'm trying to measure the supply show of the landscape lay of the land but um it is actually impossible to to uh measure something like this like globally as far as like what it means to anybody. And this goes back to your question about like, is it the booms and busts? What can we expect? You know, you get a couple more Michael Saylors, you know, coming public and, and it's like what nobody expected. Right. Yeah. So it's not, it's, it's just, that's a really important, I think Austrian point is like that, that that's a contrary to, to, to uh, Austrian economics and to subjective values to say, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like uh, Thomas DiLorenzo. I really like him. He used to say this, you know, it's like, uh, economists, like political economists today that are hired by government agencies, they think that they can, you know, it's like a Frankenstein thing, right? They think they can shock the economy back into, into life. They think they can, you know, twitch and use a tool here. Like it's a Frankenstein thing that, that is a tool. And it's the same thing with money as a measuring stick. Like you think you, you know exactly how, how long the, the ruler should be and which tools to use. And it's just, the economy does not work like that. It's completely flies in the face of subjective value where, you know, that bread could go stale. I mean, or the person could, you know, you just, you cannot, uh, everything can only be done ordinarily between two market actors 
And that happens an infinite amount of times a day. So that's just a point. Like I'm not saying I know everything about the value of Bitcoin with this, you know, with this, with this exercise. I, I you know, it, it's just, um, it, it, it's a way of, of showing the landscape in this sort of unit account of account that we understand, but it is a subtle point. Like the people in, in Japan and in China, you know, we're in Europe, U S here, kind of uh, Western, like we look at it differently than people in Latin America. Uh, you know, if gold comes down from space, we're all going to look at it gold very differently from asteroids. So yeah, I'll stop talking there. Sorry. That's, I, I think that kind of wraps up though, what you yeah. were saying about, if you know if and when and how fast this can happen because it, it can happen a lot faster than i think anybody thinks and as murray rothbard was saying for years and years this is finally coming true like there is no limit to the amount of things that the central banks can buy either we always thought that it was only government bonds now they're buying uh stocks or sorry they're buying corporate bonds the bank of japan and the bank of switzerland they've bought stocks there's no doubt i mean there's no reason why there is there are all legal reasons but they're going to find a way to get around them there's no reason why the U.S. Federal Reserve could not buy stocks and enter the stock market either. So there's no limit on the money that they can print. So in March, they, uh, the Federal Reserve was buying up ETF so because, you know, the sun and Post went down sharply. And on the day it went up, um, this was the day where the Central Bank announced that they're buying up these ETF bundles and stabilize the market or actually bail out investors. I have it in my article as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. And uh, it's mostly it's corporate bond ETFs, right? As I as I understand, um, I, I think I, I don't think there's actually any full equity yet, but um, it could easily come. And the, and the, you know the Bank of Switzerland owns Facebook. The Bank of Japan owns Facebook. They, that's with printed money. That's with money that's with printed. They own pieces of those companies. So. Uh, so they have those special, what is it called? Special vehicle or a report? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So through that mechanism, they, they could literally like buy anything, like even equities or yeah, anything. But even don't, don't think about all like the complicated structure okay. they use. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, Murray Rothbard wrote this and he wrote this in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. And it's finally really coming true. And they did it in 2008 buying real estate too, indirectly. They, they bought uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities, which were government sponsored mortgage backed securities it wasn't like kind of directly free market but still they bought them because they were junk and no one wanted to have them and they had to bail out the banks but uh murray rothbard wrote this specifically is like all that they need to do is buy assets and this is a very true fact that all that like as long as they have the monopoly power they just need to buy assets we think that it's only the government bond but um as is shown you know uh, and Stephanie talked about like it can be corporate bonds, it can be stocks, uh, and it can be Bitcoin as well. It can be Bitcoin. So there's plenty of things that that uh, I think that are, that that can and probably will happen faster than we uh, we expect. So sorry, I get on these tangents, but. Um, no, it's really, it's super overdue to talk about this. So Matthew, so thank you so much. Um, um, I can only recommend my listeners to follow you on Twitter. That's crypto underscore voices. Anything that people can follow you? I mean, I, I also love the podcast you do with Fernando. Some, most of, a lot of them are in Spanish, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, Fernando's uh, doing a lot more these days on his uh, Portuguese uh -huh. uh, show down in Brazil, uh, Portuguese language um, down in Brazil. Um, he comes on every once in a while. I'm doing this monetary based stuff a lot as well. But uh, yeah, the, the podcast is there. The monetary based exhibit that we talked about is there. Uh, CryptoVoices.com. You can also find it at BaseMoney.World. Um, and uh, there will be more to come in the future. Um, as, as as time allows, I guess so. Great, so thank super. You. So Stephanie, thanks so much for your excellent questions and your um, co moderation. Uh, any final thoughts or input? Um, well, actually, we discussed everything great length. That was awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I think it was super nice to really go into more detail and explain your view on how you went into this whole thing, that you are looking at changes in the monetary base and not measurings in some kind of US dollar, because we have to go beyond this whole thinking, okay, this would be fixed, the measurements, that this one currency would be fixed, and this is our unit of account. Yeah. And also what Austrian economics and uh, Mises said with human action and when, how a price is actually coming. So when I'm buying something, as you said, it's a subjective value. I 
prefer to have the good instead of the money. And I give the money a certain valuation and the goods a certain valuation and everything is objective and everything is up to change. And this is also something we discuss right now. Right now we are in a situation where everything can change very radically and it also very much depends on what the people think, what are their preferences, how they see the world. And there's, uh, I think we cannot really imagine right now where we're going to because there are like so many opportunities and it will be quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. All right, Matthew. Thank you so much again. I'm really grateful for your work. It, you know, you're serving humanity, you know, enhancing the comprehension and clarifying a lot of misconceptions. So thank you a lot. Calculate stuff. And hopefully we can repeat this sometime in the next year together. Sure. sure. Okay. Hey, Ivan, nice to meet you, Stephanie. Nice. Thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye, Matthew. Okay, Stephanie, let's do a, a, you know, a quick wrap up or I want to know your thoughts and uh, really mind blowing. Uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people who also have misconceptions about silver, gold, you know, the relative absolute scarcity, the stock to flow ratio. Uh, yeah. What did you think? Yeah, cool that you're mentioning right this right now, because this is also what I had in mind first, that he's really um, making everything clear, like from all perspectives, you know, looking at different monetary systems like the fiat system, Bitcoin, gold, silver. And he's like um, checking out where are the, the problems in the calculation, why do you have to compare them with the different kind of metrics. And he brought this all up to the surface. And I think that's super great. And also, yeah, as I said already, taking this different vantage point on, on looking at changes in the money supply instead of the prices of goods or the valuation and other money again, because yeah what is the base money or what is the reserve currency it might change so i really like this approach it's it's fascinating. exactly yeah. and he articulates it in the language uh, combined with the graphs you know like on uh, on his twitter thread it's that really i think every every child can understand like what he's talking about because usually you know it's like wrapped or packaged into very like like sophisticated language but you know it it it, it clarifies a lot so really grateful for his work um yeah. So yeah, and if you have any final thoughts, we can wrap this up. And thank you so much, Stephanie, for your co-moderation, for your excellent your input. Um, I can only, again, recommend all my listeners to check your articles on medium.com slash Stephanie. Uh, what's your medium name? Because it's different from your Twitter handle. Vian or Fanyan, I don't know. But Okay, okay, sure. I'll put it in the show notes. All right. Fanyan, <laughs> medium, and then I find this. Um, yeah, maybe uh, my last uh, thoughts. So what I was thinking, okay, central banks are now buying Bitcoin with their fake fiat money out of, trying to create money out of thin air. And I was like, no, somehow on one side it's good because there's more adoption and they don't ban it or hopefully. But on the other side, we really need to bring um, this idea to the world, what Bitcoin is and what the fiat system is so that we can have a change to the better system where they cannot um, actually uh, extract our wealth by printing or using the money out of the air to buy valuable assets such as Bitcoin, gold or real estate. Um, so, yeah, go, everyone who listens, go out, educate the people so that we have also the smoothest shift as possible so i do expect that it will be quite 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 some turmoil i mean we're having we're having it right now already but the financial economic uh, crash is in front of us and uh, then the people will realize oh okay this money maybe you know it's hyperinflating and it's not what i expected it to be and this will be quite shocking, I expect. So um, the more people know this, the earlier, uh, the, the better. So this is just what I can recommend. Um, tell your friends, uh, but don't be too pushy because that doesn't work as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, so the seeds. And again, I just want to, you know, final conclusion, concluding thought is that, again, it's about absolute scarcity of Bitcoin, 21 million. It doesn't matter now how many million of coins have been lost. It just really doesn't matter. And uh, there are uh, 2,500 billionaires in the world and approximately 48 million millionaires in the whole world. So just, you know, you can intuitively calculate for yourself, like how much, you know, for let's say 7.8 or 8 billion people can be allocated if we just ca calculate on the numbers, based on the numbers. So yeah, stack stats, take care of your security and privacy. And uh 
um, yeah, it's, I think it's all about, you know, the cat is out of the bag and if people understand the power of purchasing power, you know, the purchasing power <laughs> in the you know, foreseeable future. That's why, you know, so many people are now getting it, you know, even the macro world and uh, investor world and uh, institutional and ultra net uh, rich people and individuals, they're getting it. So it really makes me happy. Yeah, we can create a wonderful future for everyone, to be honest. Yeah. When we of these central authorities that actually extract wealth out of us, put us in poverty, which is all a, a mean so we don't question the whole system and legitimize it. If we get rid of all these things, we can build a better future for everyone on humane values, you know, um, where there's no coercion. So um, I think the opportunities we have for the future are not really imaginable for so many. And um, I really hope that we will go to this transition the smoothest as, as possible and the soon as possible, because it's really a time. There's so much suffering and yeah. um, to make a change. Yeah, it's really beyond imagination, beyond words, to be honest with you. If I observe everything what's going on, the the I mean the the state, the governments, the central banks, I mean let alone they're above the law, but just understanding that they have lost and they have never had a, a legitimacy. And it's a I mean, what do you what do you call it? You just you just said it previously. It's it's criminal and it's it's systematic theft. It they have a monopoly on violence, aggression on on theft. And I think people, it's really time to wake up and, and you know, when, when, you know, the crimes are becoming so heinous and so horrendous, you know, people always talk about Nazi regime, you know, or whatever. I mean, when, when, you know, things have become so unjust, then it's our moral and, you know, ethical, not only for ourselves, but our for posterity to resist, to defy and to, yeah. And uh, I mean, we're 8 billion people for Christ's sake. <laughs> it's got to be possible, you know, I mean, when, when is like the finishing point like you know when how, how much are we going to endure or you know or is it already like five minutes past 12 this is a question i'm asking myself nowadays you know uh because of the centralized power it is this control obsessive power that's you know just just blowing up and, and it uh i don't know it's 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 i have no words for that just just think about that you know to my listeners yeah. all right stephanie Happy to talk to you again soon and have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. It was nice to see you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Stephanie. -bye. Bye,